So in contrast to We Are Not Alone, where you said they weren't even like the label wasn't sure which song would be the lead single for a long time. Was this the case with the second record, Phobia, that they knew right away Diary of Jane was going to be the big hit? We all knew Diary of Jane was designated as a, as a song. There was a couple of great songs on that record we loved. But Diary of Jane was ambiguous enough lyrically because, you know, nobody could sort of figure out what it was about. Hmm. And, of course, I knew what it was about. And I think it in, invoked a lot of imagination lyrically and the melody you know, would you like that? We, we were hitting them with hooks long before the chorus came, you know. Mm. And so we knew that the the um, the verses were extremely powerful. Ben could write a chorus that you just want to hear over and over again. That was his, his, his great ability. And I think we all knew from the demo that, that it was a special song. We spent at least three weeks in, in Ben's basement recording the demos and practicing. Diary of Jane had four choruses. So I would come down to the basement. He goes, well, the next song's Diary of Jane. I was like, what, what's this about? It would always be this conversation. What's the song about? How are we approaching it? The guitar parts in that song were always brilliant. I mean, Aaron had parts and, and Ben had parts worked out. They were both brilliant. Ben sort of sat with his acoustic guitar and sang me four completely different choruses. And so all of them did not have a post-chorus. In, you know, in the Diary of Jane, so tell me how it would be was never existent in existence. And I pretty well drove him nuts for three or four days. Like, it would be great if we had like a post course to this, because it kind of just leaves you hanging. It's like something, no, something's getting in the way. Something's about to break, but it never ended. There was no, you know, but in the Diary of Jane, so tell me how that encapsulated and put bookends. That's cool. Man. So we went with the chorus that's currently there, I think it was like the second or third, maybe it was the first one. Maybe it was the first one he had, you know, because he wasn't sure which chorus he liked. Uh -huh. I said, we'll take that and then we change it. And then, you know, within a couple of days, he had the the ending of the chorus. And we had to add the chords on because there was no chords there. And then at the ending, we had a completely different ending that went on this whole huge vocal thing that I wanted to do with a choir. Really? And we mocked, Yeah, we mocked it up, and it, I loved it. I thought it was great. Did you guys actually you know, record that and then not use it? Like, what was the story there exactly? Let me see if I can find it. It's interesting. So right uh, here, a chorus would come in? Sorry? So right here would be that chorus that comes in? Yeah, so it just kept on going, oh, oh, it's like a choir effect. That's really cool. Do you have yeah. like I mean you were just looking at it now, but like does does a record does a version of that exist somewhere? Yeah, right here. <laughs> you gotta find it, man. <laughs> All right, hang on, hang on. Uh, I found it. You found it? Oh, okay. No, it's not. It's on another file. Uh, don't worry about it. Just basically cool. this. I'll find it. That is it's really like cool. A, this long choral ending. I mean, I don't know where they changed it. They probably changed it at the label. I mean, they did that all the time to us. Like they would edit something and change it and not tell us or cut a section in half. See, what happened was when they mixed it, they started to edit it and change it. I should say this. Nobody nobody probably even knows about this, but when Diary of Jane came out, we hadn't even heard the mix or the mastering. In fact, they got a completely different person to mix it behind our backs. Behind the mixer's back, behind the band's back and behind my back. Then they mastered it, the label, and then they put it out. So when I heard it on the radio, I'd never heard it before. Really? Yeah. And But that, that's really cool. You have all these alternative versions of it. You got to release those I, eventually. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have that for all the songs. I would keep everything. That's you know? so cool. So when I, when I moved to another record, I could learn the evolution of a song mm. and apply some of the same ideas um, that, that, it, that, that, that that was great about a certain song or maybe not to try and make the same song over again because uh, you'd already done that in another song or, you know, because songs were like verse, chorus or pre-chorus, chorus, verse, you know. So you try and throw in some things. The greatest thing I think about Breaking Benjamin was, you know, they would always throw different things in. You never knew what was going to happen. Um, so the arrangements, we tried to make them very clever and sort of drawing a little bit more on Nirvana 
or pop rock, you know, whatever you want to call that. That's cool, man. That's cool. So if I may ask, I mean, you mentioned that you know what Diary of Jane is about. Would you be allowed to disclose what the song is about? No, because by now, the songs that whatever it is, hundreds of millions of plays, everybody took something different from that song. And it's quite an angry song, hmm. you know. And so I think a lot of writers that write like Ben does, which is very to the point, in his mind, it's clear. He's also using words that are very powerful in groups. Hmm. And they're not a lot of words. If You know, if you look at the lyrics, it's not like Leonard Cohen. Hmm. It's not like Bob Dylan. These, these are very short, it's more melodically driven mm-hmm. and more. So, so the answer to your question is, you know, it would serve no purpose for me to, to give away the reason or meaning of a song. I know when I worked in the studio with every artist I worked with, I would get a different meaning than the artist has, <laughs> you know, because I would also peel back the layers and talk to the artists about themselves and their lives. And so I would immediately get a, a totally different vision for the song than they did. I hear you. It was tough because they, we were late on this record. The band had kind of put it off and it was taking way longer in the studio. We were late. So the weird part about this was that as we finished the song, mm-hmm. we had to send it to Ben Gross that day. Oh, cool. Okay. And then he would be in his studio mixing and the label was sort of go over to ben's gross's house or studio every day and listen to his mix Hmm. so it was really weird it was like a i can't even describe it it was like an assembly line of we would finish the track send it to ben gross he would mix it and then they would master it the next day so that which you don't ever do that you finish an album then you mix an album then you master an album in this case it was one at a time now you know to get down dirty which i'm gonna i don't think i've ever picked any song said that's a hit you know you'd never do that to jinx the whole record Hmm. so i can tell you that there was certain songs i felt strong about and that the band did but nobody ever said that's a smash a number one that would never ever happen Hmm. And if we did, it would be like people would look at each other going, oh, come on. Yeah. Nobody knows what's going to happen. That's the truth. Mm-hmm. We have no clue. But we felt good about the song. Uh, and Ben had done a pretty good job on the demos of that song, of, of this record, Phobia. He'd spent a lot of time programming some things, drum parts, and he would always get angry at uh, Chad for not being able to play them, even though they were physically and technically impossible to play, hmm. you know, because when you program, I love it when singers program drums <laughs> for a drummer in a rock band and, you know, well, wait a minute, you're hitting this, the, uh, the cymbal and the hi-hat at the same time. And, and the, you know, you, you do things that you physically can't do, but nobody thinks like that when you're writing parts because you're trying to write a good song. So anyway, that was funny. But rehearsals were good. I'm not going to lie and often say Ben didn't get cold feet before we started that record. Okay. Um, he did right at the very last minute. Didn't want to go. You know, Ben didn't like to travel anywhere. Hmm. You know, yeah. that he, he definitely didn't want to fly anywhere. If I may uh, ask, so why yeah. is that? You mentioned that a couple of times now. Why does he not like to fly? Well, that's why we called the record Phobia. I, I named it Phobia. Really? That's the reason. But Ben has phobias and they're very serious. And a lot of people do not Ben, but everybody, you know, whether it's spiders or snakes or flying heights, most people are scared scared to stand at the edge of a 65 story building and look down. Um, These are inexplicable things in our lives that, that sometimes are debilitating, you know? Um, And, and, uh, you know, people are paranoid about certain things for lots of reasons. And one of the things Ben didn't want to do was fly. And I don't think he has since, hmm. you know, he, which stopped Europe. Of course, we weren't going to go tour. The band never toured Europe until hmm. after I stopped working with them, which was four albums in. Hmm. They never went to England or Germany or, I mean, I'm sure we could have sold a hundred times the records we've sold. Hmm. Um, but, but 
Eventually, I think he did take a, a, a boat there. Pretty sure he did. Anyway, but it wasn't just that. It was like, you know, pouring rain, driving, all those kinds of things. So if you listen to the first track on Phobia, it was something I put, I, I, I mixed as well. The first track and the last track. And it's to set up all of the phobias that are involved in that record. Interesting. If you listen to it carefully, you'll hear planes crashing and airline stewardesses talking and right. all of the things that, that been the rain coming down, the car door slamming. It's it's a whole, you know, it's it, it, it is if you were lying down and you were imagining all those things. That that was the idea behind it. Now, sometimes you pull those things off and other times you don't. I think I did a pretty good job, you know, although it's not something when I listen to the record, I can bear to sit through, you know, but I tried to make them each like a minute and a half, whatever they are long, mm. to set up the idea of phobia. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, 100%. So, you know, I spoke um, a couple of times with Jonathan Plum, who worked with Allison Chain. He's a really nice guy. And he said that one of the interesting things about Lane Staley is that Lane had an easier time doing the screaming vocals than the quieter vocals. Lane's just naturally loud, so that works for him. When it came to Ben, was it easier for him to do like the heavier stuff or the quieter stuff? <clears throat> well, you gotta understand, Ben was not your normal kind of singer. His influences were so far and wide. I mean, one minute you'd go to Corn, the next minute you could go to the Deftones, the next minute you're Nirvana, and then you'd go to Maynard at Tool. So Bain had a very, very good grip on all of those four characters hmm. and found a way to make his own sound out of those influences. So the answer to your question is each song was bespoke and sort of written and sang to what the song was asking for. Hmm. Ben had the ability to do a song like Forget It and then scream on another song or do rain, which is a nursery rhyme, and then do cold. So the beauty was that there was many influences. I spoke with Michael Beinhorn recently, and he said that when he was recording Super Unknown, Chris Cornell would like to be basically completely alone when he's recording vocals. Like He wants nobody there. Was, yeah. was there anything like that with Benjamin, or did he not care if people were around? If I wasn't there, he wouldn't sing. Huh. I mean, it would always be one of those things. And I stood up in the studio a lot with Ben and mouthed the words to get timing. So I would do that all the time. With all three records? Hell yeah. That's cool, no, man. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. And I would conduct with my hands, you know. <laughs> That's awesome. Because uh, we all we could always see each other. Musically, how is he like in the studio? So for instance, I spoke with Mike Frazier recently, and he said that when Brian Johnson would record vocals, Brian Johnson would actually physically hold the mic. Another guy I spoke to said Perry Farrell would actually run around the studio when he's singing. Was there anything peculiar about Benjamin in the studio? Well, yeah, I mean, everybody is different. And it's funny, uh, with singers, every singer has a window in their, in their day where they're great. And, you know, you got to be careful. I mean, you try and get a singer in the studio at 10 o'clock till noon. You know, when I say a window... Nobody can sing for longer than three or four hours. Not really. I mean, they might tell you they can. I know Bruce Springsteen does a, a four-hour show. Mm. So, you know, but I don't think it's, I'll tell you my Breaking Benjamin, Bruce Springsteen story, which is pretty amazing. Oh, that's cool. Um, but Because I, I have one. But with Ben, there was a window. It was usually like three in the afternoon, four in the afternoon till seven. And then maybe after dinner, sometimes eight till 11. In regards to where we recorded, we tried recording with him singing with a microphone. We put a big foam thing around it in okay. the control room and let him try and sing. And then we had him in the big room. We had him in the small room. And I think for the most part, we just left him in the big room in the center. And uh, the one thing though that you, and it's very dangerous when you're playing in A sharp and the guitars and the bass, or imagine the bass tuned to A sharp drop, you know, these notes don't exist through headphones, you know? So what I'm saying is that when you're wearing headphones, it's very hard to make out the tonality, hmm. you know, as opposed to listening with speakers and getting the bottom end and uh, the, the definition. One of the things I think we did was put some clean guitar tracks on there so we could, or acoustic guitar tracks, so oh, the band could sing, sing along because uh, A sharp 
and, and that kind of robust singing is difficult to do. In Ben's case, I would say a lot of it was instinct um, because he knew and, and had written these melodies that where to go instinctively, and his, his pitch was pretty good. Having said that, we did do multiple takes. You know, we do, we do a, a set of 10 of a section, let's say a verse, and then we would stop for 10, 15 minutes and then do it again and then comp together the best vocal take. So e even though, say, the whole record was probably, the whole song was sung in two hours, you know, we would go through each each uh, track and audition certain lines or certain timings that we felt uh, suited the song more. So am I going to tell you that he didn't sing a whole verse or a whole chorus? That would be a lie too, because sometimes it would just be one of those magical moments where we, mm. we would just sing and we'd go, that take, you know, of that whole chorus was insane. That's but cool. it's very difficult for anybody to sing a whole song from top to bottom, you know. Yeah, for sure. In a one, once in a lifetime performance with timing and tuning and not get, you know, any mistakes. That's kind of dumb. Mm -hmm. in, in some instances where it was like attitude -y, we did take the whole song and, you know, we, but we would always go back and spend time comping things together. That's interesting. So when it came to Ben, was he the kind of singer who, like, let's say he'd sing for 20 minutes, 30 minutes straight, take a break, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, or would he go for two hours straight? We, I would never do that to anybody I knew better. Mm -hmm. I mean, once you go for two hours straight, you're burning somebody out. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's never going to work. So I would say 30 minutes, you know, 30 to 40 minutes of a verse or a chorus or a bridge, and then stop for 10 minutes and then repeat. Hmm. Sometimes you sing the song four or five times. You know, and also when you're dealing with tape, it's a little bit different. Hmm. And by that time, I think we were on Pro Tools. So uh, we had the ability to be able to audition different takes. You know, we would bring them up on different faders. That's cool. And, and audition the different takes. Interesting. And like when it came to what we're listening to on the records, is his voice doubled or is that usually like a single track? Ben loved doubling. I mean, that was his favorite thing. The more the merrier. <laughs> the problem with that in Ben's case though, for me, was that his voice was so identifiable and so powerful. <laughs> a double would thicken it. But sometimes when it, when it got very emotional, when you double something, when it's emotional, it takes away the intimacy because you've got free people being intimate with you, you know, <laughs> um, and, and trying to match yourself perfectly. Uh, if you match yourself perfectly, it phases, you know, the, it phases itself. So you start to lose things. Uh, so I would say I was extremely delicate when I would bring those double tracks up. Where I put them was really important, mm. uh, you know, because the minute you go left, right, which is where the guitars are and the drum uh, room mics are. Uh, you're creating sort of this left, right vocals and, and drums and cymbals and guitars. And so it gets a little confusing. So I started to move everything in, you know, to 10, 10 and two. And uh, that way I, we could control it a little bit more. And it sounded a little bit more organic and natural to me. That's so cool.